you, Sydney. How old are you, Sydney? How, how old is Sydney? She's seven? Six. <clears throat> well, in saying this, I might make you more embarrassed, <clears throat> but uh, it takes a lot of courage to get up here. She's only six, but I know some people who are 60 and still have never come up here to do a special of any type, so uh, it takes a lot of courage. Thank you, Sydney. That was very nice. One of our first graders down at the school had the privilege to give a little talk there just the other day and saw one of the two Angies anyway, and uh, the school's doing a real good job this year. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. <clears throat> Depending on the translation you have, it would be in red because they're the words of our Master, Matthew 5, 6. Some might think the verses are put in the wrong place. Some might think the verses say the wrong thing, but they are what they are. Matthew 5, 6, my version says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. <clears throat> and if you're like me, it would really be nice if it stopped there. As we continue through this verse today, we'll unpack it more and more because it says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father in heaven, it's our prayer this morning that you would touch our minds, touch our ears, especially touch my mouth that you would be doing your work here this morning on everybody here present. We pray it in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> what motivates people to eat? I'm going to ask several questions here today. I, I always love it when the Wigney family's here because uh, they always have lots of quality answers. It's good to see you here today. <clears throat> what is something that motivates people to eat? I heard a voice. Where was it coming from? Oh, and, uh, hunger. So when you get hungry, then you eat. How many of us like that when it comes to Thanksgiving and Christmas and, you know, this afternoon? And I do. I'll raise both hands. It's, you know, you get hungry and then you eat, and we get satisfied. If you make a good decision, you choose some good food, and it tastes good. I mean, God gave us taste buds, praise the Lord. And it also, you know, it feels nice. You're finally full. And, but we also have a choice. When we feel hungry, we can choose to eat bad food, and then we feel what? Not so good, depending on what we eat and how much we eat. <laughs> Guilty and <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> well, in the spiritual world, what motivates us to eat? The need. Okay, anybody else? I think I heard someone say stress. Did I hear someone say? Trials. Anybody else? <clears throat> We're less eager when it comes to spiritual. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> yes, yeah, nice coping mechanism. Yes, yes. Many Americans that that many Americans are going to that doctor. Yes, <laughs> yes. And in the spiritual realm, it's not that different than the physical. Physically, we get hungry, then we eat. Spiritually, God set us up so that we hunger first, and then we eat. It's Matthew 5, 6. 
blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, His righteousness, not our own. But we have to hunger and thirst first, and then what's the result? Satisfied, be filled. But how many of us like that principle, that hunger is the prerequisite to being satisfied? How many of us really like it? Thanksgiving, it's okay. I'll get hungry, and man, if you, you know, if you eat the clean meats, you oh, some turkey, you know, if you don't, little, you know, a little fake steak, and, and potatoes, and beans, and cranberries, and if you like gravy, and I mean, uh, three plates, and oh, man, God bless America, and those pilgrims, Thanksgiving, it's coming up close, Right? And pies, and ah, oh, my mom always used to have good food, and the pumpkin pies, and whipped cream. Ah, oh, I, I could just have whipped cream for a meal. I love it. I love it, especially the homemade, not the store, but I mean the real stuff. And uh, I've learned to appreciate lemon meringue pie. And, you know, if you get three, four plates, and then two, three desserts, and it's like, oh, it's time to, if you can make it, you get out to the couch, and <laughs> if you stay awake, maybe watch the game, talk, but... When you're hungry and you eat, it's nice, right? How about if you eat three, four plates and you have three, four pies and you're, I mean, beyond full? We shouldn't eat this way, but I'm I'm illustrating it because many of us have and we know what I'm referring to. So after you've had that huge Thanksgiving meal, how about if your wife or your husband or your mom or wherever you're at comes by and says, I've just prepared the most delightful meal. Would you be hungry to eat it? No. It's natural. It's normal. Hunger first, and then you get satisfied. But when it comes to the spiritual realm, sometimes we don't like that principle very much. We don't like the hunger pains. I don't want to feel that way. There's this myth floating around in, in, in Christianity, no matter what denomination you belong to, that we shouldn't suffer. I don't want to hunger. And Jesus kind of shared this principle <clears throat> when He was here on the earth, and the people who heard it had a really hard time appreciating it, to put it lightly. Matthew 5, 6, blessed are those who hunger. Blessed are those who thirst for righteousness, for they are the ones that shall be satisfied. It's a unique verse. <clears throat> who, who was Jesus speaking to? Can you find some verses here this morning with the original audience? <clears throat> definitely, we'll make the application. It'll definitely apply to us. <clears throat> but initially, in the first audience. Who was Jesus speaking to? You can look in the last couple of verses of chapter 4 or chapter 5 or chapter 6. Who was Jesus speaking to originally? And if, once you've got it, raise your hand, and the first thing I want to hear is a verse. We don't want to pull it out of thin air. No visions this morning. <clears throat> Margie? Chapter 5, yes. verse 1, okay? And the audience would be? The disciples and... <clears throat> Okay, the disciples are there and the multitude. Any other verses near this that would give us an idea of who this great multitude is? Keith. Verse 425. Okay, verse 25, chapter 4, Decapolis, Judea, and that area around there. So those of you who, who brought your scriptures this morning, turn to the back. <clears throat> as long as you don't have a cute little makeup-sized Bible, turn to the back, and there's maps back there. It's like we're going to, maybe, maybe my experience at school earlier this week, uh, I, I'm taking you back to school. Slip back to the back and look in the back and you'll find maps. And you'll see where this town Decapolis is at and Judea and all these names that are referred there in chapter 24 and verse 24 and 25. When someone has the light bulb turn on, raise your hand. We want to see who are these people.
And we'll, all right. <clears throat> the question is, because um, you had found the verse, there's chapter 5, verse 1, then chapter 4, verse 23 and 24 and 25, where it says these people were from Galilee, Syria, uh, Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond the Jordan. So I'm just curious, as we're looking at our map, who are these people? And we're hoping to have a hand and then hear from someone that hasn't shared this morning. We don't want all the answers to come from the front here. So the question is, who are these people? We know they're from this area, but who are they? Who are they? I was thinking it was going to be a short sermon today, shorter than last week, but it might turn into longer than last week. <laughs> yeah, well, that's a safe bet. They're not Americans. Okay, it's a start. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Who are these people? Usually in the back you got maps that are during Moses' day and during the Apostles' day, and we're looking at a map that would help us during Jesus' day, and you'll see some of those names of the cities. <clears throat> the question, the hour is, who are these people? Well, one of the names is Jerusalem, so that might be a little bit of a challenge. Well, Galilee is there too. Yeah, we got the disciples. Did you have a question, Margie? It's just, it's the Middle East area. Well, well, I mean, zoom it in a little bit. We've eliminated America, thanks to your husband. So keep zooming it in. It's not the entire Middle East. It would be... Well, Galilee is also mentioned there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Those of you who are about to start the small group study are going to lose a lot of hair <laughs> for taking this long for this kind of question. <laughs> Brace yourselves. <clears throat> oh, I'm hearing a voice in the wilderness. Who's delivering us? Stand up, Aaron. They could handle hearing this loud and clear. They're Jewish. If one thing you've noticed, these towns are all connected to the nation of Israel. That would make them what? Jewish. That would make them professed believers in the one true God. That would even make them that really difficult word that starts with an R, the remnant. And here, Jesus, the one sent from the Father, is telling this group, this group, you will be blessed if you are hungry and if you're thirsty. Only if you hunger and thirst for righteousness for Him, then you'll be satisfied. It seems strange that you'd have to be telling a professed, believing, commandment-keeping, remnant group, oh, now don't forget, you should probably be hungry for me. You should be hungry for me. And if we scan through history and we look at the average person in their day in this group, in these towns that went to these churches, that kept the Sabbath, those expecting a Messiah that thought it was good to do good and bad to do bad. How did these average church-attending people do with this principle? Was their willingness to be spiritually satisfied, was that proportionate to their willingness to be hungry for it? I'll repeat it again. Was this initial group church 
people. They memorized whole sections of the Bible. They were, they were serious about their church business. Serious. He had to remind them that you have to hunger first before you get satisfied. And my question this morning is, because I, you know, I, I think back about this original group, and I really don't think that their desire to be satisfied was proportionate to their willingness to hunger for it. And it's not just me pulling it out of the air and guessing, because it wasn't that long what they do to Jesus, the one that taught them this principle. They killed him. They said, well, we want a king that just comes here and sits down on his throne, and we all line up and say, well, you know, well, I'd, I'd like a new car, and I really want that second house. It's been a tough economy. We kind of lost our second one, but I'd like it back. And, and uh, you know, I'd like to be a little more popular, and, you know, can you pull in my waist? And, you know, I need a little more money, and well, I'd like to go to heaven, and I'd like this, and I'd like that. And, and the question is, are you… Are you, you want those things, because there's good and bad things we can want, but was that original audience, were they proportionate to what they were hungering for and what they wanted to be satisfied in? Was it proportionate? The original audience, I don't think so. And sometimes today it's like we forget that when we hunger, when we go through trials and we suffer a little bit. Sometimes we forget that today, don't we? When we go through trials, some of us want to quit. Sometimes we want to just spin in a circle and not do anything. Sometimes when we go through stuff, we slide back into our old habits. We get angry. When that long ago, I just moved here. Some of you met my friend. I know you guys are still praying for him, and I really appreciate that. Some of you met my friend Stacy, helped drive up my wife and I and some of our stuff. And uh, it's like I've got this little plague following me. Some of the people that associate with me, their life falls apart. He was one of them. Lost his business, lost his money, lost his house. Wife divorced him, took the kids. If that wasn't enough, had his pickup stolen. Made me think of Araceli and her family. They were saying how they had some of their mail stolen earlier this year. The same thing. They stole his mail, stole his clothing, stole his computer, it's like everything, everything was just either taken or broken. And, I, and he was still come to church, had very little, but what he had, he shared. And uh, going through terrible stress, still going to church, going to small group studies, praising the Lord. It was a shining example of what it's like to go through miserable times, but to say, well, my life isn't you know, grounded on the fact that all this stuff is nice. It's grounded on Jesus. And Jesus didn't go anywhere. He was in the same place He always was. He was still growing. But I know other people that I've ministered in the past, and something happens, and within a week they're back doing the same habits. And it, it really doesn't matter what the habits are. Everybody's bad habits are different, but it, they're still bad habits. He got back into all the same bad habits that Christ just pulled him out of and took years to get him out of. It was like some big surprise had overtaken him, like it says in 1 Peter chapter 4. He says, don't consider it a surprise that this bad stuff is happening. It's amazing how much of the Scriptures tell us about bad things happening to believers, but it's one of the least things talked about today in Christianity. And when it happens, and I know it's tough to hear, because when it is happening to you and someone else is sharing that, you think, well, you're not in my shoes. It's not easy to go through. And I understand that, but it doesn't change the biblical principles. Hunger comes before we get satisfied. So how are you doing this morning? When God is surrounding your little camp, stirring up in your stomach this deeper desire to have a deeper experience? Are you fighting the hunger pains? Are you filling your hunger pains for, with Christ? 
Or are you filling your hunger pains with something else that doesn't satisfy? He might make us hungry and feel lonely. Do we spend that time with Him? Or do we say, oh, I'm just so lonely tonight. You know, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn on something funny. You know, that, that Letterman guy, he's funny sometimes. Or Leno is back, I guess, or something like that. He's funny. I'm lonely. I should turn it on. I just, you know, September starting, all the new sitcoms are coming. Finally, fortunately, we were just so bored here in America without new versions of TV. So we can, new sitcoms will be on. I won't be so lonely now. Has anyone ever thought, and even the ones who are viewing this, has anyone ever thought maybe God makes us or allows us to get lonely so we actually seek for Him? He lets us be friends and praise Him for it. I love it. I'm happy to be married. My parents are here. I love my parents, and I'm learning to appreciate you guys and have relationships with you. It's phenomenal. But there's a little niche in each one of us that can't be filled by anything other than Him. But it's so easy as Americans and, and just humans to fill that up with something else. And it, and it just, it's like sugar. It's kind of like, wow, that, yeah, that's nice. But then five minutes later, you, you don't even go back to where you were. You kind of feel even less. Sometimes he makes us hungry because he wants to, he's trying to stir us into something deeper with him. He's not trying to get us. Guess what? <laughs> he's not trying to come after you or me. Sometimes he's letting it happen on purpose because he's wanting to pull us closer. Sure, it's uncomfortable, it's unusual, it's, it's different, but that's God. God is not like us. And like a good parent with a child, who knows better, a good parent or the child? And, that, and that's it's just a pale analogy of what it's like between us and God. Amen? God knows better than us. If for whatever reason He wants us to go through a trial right now, we should be like Job. I don't get it, and I don't really, I'm not sure why, but praise Him anyway. And let, let's pray. Now, I don't know why he's doing it, but he does, and I like him anyway. He's going to get me through it somehow or other. Slip, slip over to uh, Psalms, Psalms chapter 42. We sung about it. It was, it was very providential. The, the praise singer sang it, and uh, it's a wonderful song. Psalms 42, this is where they get part of it anyway. Psalms 42, we'll read the first three verses. As the deer pants for the water brooks, so my soul pants for you, God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night, while they say to me all day long, where's God? It's tough enough to go through a bad time and have your own sinful mind say, why isn't God helping more? That's tough enough. But it's a whole other thing when you're going through a tough time and someone else is saying, God isn't doing anything for you. The person who wrote this psalm was saying, as an animal is just panting, begging, longing for water and for food. That's how he was longing to be with God. The praise team just sang it. It's a beautiful song. Most of us know the words, as a deer panteth for the water, so my soul longeth after you. What's the next line? You're my heart's desire. We can sing it. Some of you know it by heart. Do we just sing the song, though? Or, or are we living the words? 
Are we really hungry for a relationship with Jesus? Because the reality is, hunger comes before we are satisfied. If you fight the hunger and you hate the hunger and you don't want to have a, a hunger pain for Jesus, you'll never, ever, and I mean ever, get to where you really feel satisfied with Jesus Christ. Never. Because spiritual hunger comes before spiritual satisfaction. Jesus said it. It was in the Sermon on the Mount, one of the most talks about, spoke about scriptures and sermons. It was from our master himself. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They shall be satisfied. If you have just a teeny little hunger, well, guess what your experience will be like in Jesus Christ? Teeny. If you ever wonder, well, why aren't I really growing? Look at how much you hunger for Jesus Christ. It's probably just a little bit. And if you yourself or you know someone who's really satisfied in Christ, behind closed doors, they're doing a lot of starving for Christ, a lot of hungering, a lot of thirsting, a lot of late nights, a lot of early mornings when all they do, like in Psalms 42, is that, or they'd be just driving down the road by themselves, sometimes emotionally, literally crying, sometimes just in their mind, wanting God to be closer, to be more. But hunger comes before satisfaction. We looked at the original audience. I'm curious this morning, how is it with you? How is the proportion and the balance in your life? We're all here today, so we want to, you know, think there's a God and think there's a Ten Commandments and the Sabbath, and we want to go to heaven. We want to have a relationship with Jesus. We want to have devotions. We want to be good people, good parents, good spouses, and good Americans. And we can go through a whole long list of really genuinely good stuff. But the question is, is our life in balance? Is our life proportionate to all the things you want to be satisfied in? Is it even close to proportionate to your willingness to hunger for it? Is it even close? Often the spiritual life is one of the most forgotten things with Americans. We'll spend lots of money to go to a gym, you know, so we, you know, we got to look nice in the mirror, you know, because we all know that, at, you know, in the work and when you're trying to find somebody and just life, I mean, you know, if you're dressed nice and look nice, I mean, things, a few, a few more doors will open. Is it right? No, but that's kind of reality in America. We're shallow. So we'll go to health clubs and we'll, we'll spend an hour and a half lifting heavy stuff. And jogging for an hour. Oh, I, I, can, I can go for six miles straight, and, and, uh, and, and every single mile is under five minutes a mile, and, and we're just hungering to work harder because I know if I discipline my body, the result is I'll look better and I'll be healthy, and, and et cetera, et cetera. We do it physically in work. Oh, I'll go to this school. It costs 30 grand a year. When I'm done, I'll owe over $100,000 to a school. So I can get out and get this job and I can make more money and I'll make more money. Well, then, uh, you know, the, the, whether you're male or female, the other sex will, you know, you'll have more options to more wonderful people to marry. And well, then, you know, supposedly, like our kids care, our kids will have what we never had, which is money and no relationships. But anyway. Um, so we'll have that, and we can get a better job, so we can work 80 hours a week, and, you know, because that's the American dream. That's exciting. So we'll go to school and get into all this stuff as a discipline. We'll do it in many areas of our life, school, exercise, on and on. But spiritually, do we ever discipline ourselves or even let the Holy Spirit? We don't even rarely have to do it. The Holy Spirit does it. 
but do we let the Holy Spirit do His job and make us hunger for Him? It's getting to be rare. It's getting to be a rare day when people want to hunger for Jesus Christ. And, and we don't have that proportion. It's not in balance. We want to be satisfied in so many things, but we don't want to hunger for it. I mean, I see a few heads nodding out here. I don't think I'm the only one out here. I don't think I'm deceived. Many people, even church people, often we're not really hungering for it. And we come up with excuses. Well, I'm American. I'm wealthy. I'm educated. I'm an Adventist. I'm Christian, whatever. Throw up reasons why I really shouldn't have to hunger for it. Why shouldn't Jesus just give me everything I need? How many times have you ever been in a dating relationship where you did all the work? Would you count that a healthy relationship? When you did everything, that's not a healthy relationship. Yeah, Jesus can do it all, but that's not a healthy relationship. He wants us to hunger for Him because it's a privilege. How many of you really got excited when you held someone's hand for the first time? Yeah, Keith, you know, it's all right, I see that. I did. God gave us relationships. They're good, but they're best when they're two-way. Amen? Why do we forget that when it's Jesus? It's like we're in a day and age where if I... And I kid you not, this is a statistic for the average Christian in America. If they come twice a month, but, or at most, 24 times a year, that is the commitment of the Christian leader today. Yeah. 24 times a year, that's about how much the average Christian leader goes to church this day. Not Sabbath, I'm just talking about, you know, church on the weekend. That's leader. That's leader. That's leader. And we think, what's the big deal, pastor? I mean, my words, it's noon, let's keep, come on, you're making me uncomfortable, and I mean, I've, it's the first time I've been here in four months, and you should be happy. It's not about me. It's about what's in your own tummy. When you get hungry, no one needs to tell you as an adult, well, now, come on, Jen, we should probably take you to the kitchen, and, you know, you're probably hungry, and, well, just sit down, let's get you something to eat, and if you're hungry, you eat. If we should really hunger for Christ, not twice a year when our spouse got in a car wreck or the other time because well, it's Easter, but hunger for Jesus. If we don't, it's not a surprise we're not really that satisfied. It's not a surprise to me why America, Christianity, or even Adventism, in my opinion as a whole, really isn't that robust and healthy as Christians. We want a lot, but our willingness to hunger for Christ getting lower in some pockets. But praise the Lord, He's alive, He's well. There are still people who are hungering and thirsting, and many of you are, and that's very good news because the reality is hunger comes before satisfaction. Matthew 5, 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They shall be satisfied. I've got to confess, as I've gone through life, sometimes in my life, I haven't always been that hungry. And as I lived life before and after ministry, or before enduring, also I have to admit I've noticed that I'm not the only one. Sometimes I bump into people at all levels of church that really aren't hungry for Christ. The 
The question is today, how hungry are you for Jesus Christ? If you're hungry for Jesus, He will satisfy you. If you've got a little hunger, well, and he'll throw you a crumb. Just like the lady said, well, even the dogs get the crumbs. Well, you want a crumb? Here it is. If you want a robust relationship where you can really make an impact on people, hunger for it. Hunger, and it will be yours. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they shall be satisfied. If the praise team would come up at this time and sing our closing hymn, give us something to think about. How hungry are we for Jesus? It's appropriate so close to lunch. Almost every one of us have a stomach that is growling and hungry. How hungry are we for Jesus Christ? Matthew 5, 6, these, these are the words of our Master, our Savior, our Creator, the one who forgives us, cleans us, and will bring us to heaven if you want to be with Him. They're uncomfortable, they're misplaced, they're inappropriate. Many of us are uncomfortable with it and don't even like it. But He's God and He does what He wants. He created us in a very unique way to be hungry first. He said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, His character, His righteousness, His relationship, and they shall be satisfied. I want to end this morning with an altar call. Simple, nothing over the top. But as I said before the uh, praise music, sometimes in my life, I haven't really been that hungry. You don't have to raise your hand, but, you know, many of us have been there. This morning is not a condemnation, but the altar call is an invitation. It's not a time to gossip and say, well, I wonder what's happening. But it's an altar call to just simply say, if you feel that hunger in your belly, not for food, but for Jesus, it would be an appropriate time to come up as we close in prayer together and we can as a group pray to say, Lord, you're putting this hunger in me. I want to hunger for you more. And I don't want little Debbie snacks. I want you to fill this hunger with Jesus Christ. And if that's your hunger this morning, you want more hunger and you want Jesus to get in your tummy, if you would come on up this morning and we'll close in prayer together.
you'll probably get tired of me reading this verse. And those who are watching on the DVD probably just think I'm being repetitious. But the verse is clear, powerful, and in my opinion, a little uncomfortable. Because Jesus said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Hunger comes before satisfaction. So that means the reality is some of us who are up here this morning, I'm, I'm not someone who's into misleading people. Some of us who are, it could be me. Some of us who are up here this morning, that means that maybe Jesus will actually allow more trials to stir up even more hunger. I don't know anybody that likes trials. We like the fruit that comes after it. Amen? So wrapped up in this prayer is to say, Lord, don't let go of my hand. Help me hang on as I go through more hunger. Because it's not comfortable going through a serious hunger. It's not comfortable. But the satisfaction when you get filled is good. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're up front not because we're better or because we're worse. We're here because we're hungry. And we've got a dangerous request, which we think is motivated by the Holy Spirit. We want to hunger even more. But we, we, we insist because it's your desire, Jesus. We, we want to be filled with your righteousness not our little plan or substitute, but fill us, Father, with Jesus. Help us to hang in there when we go through the valley of the shadow of death. And help us when, when as a church member said earlier today, when one of us is hurting and one isn't, motivate us, Lord, that the one who's not hurting to help carry and lift and encourage the one that is. Knit us together into you, Christ, to be a family. Make us more hungry for Jesus and serve us a portion of Jesus' death and resurrection every minute of every day of our lives. We desperately need it, even more than we know. We thank you, Father, for hearing this prayer and answering it as you know best, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You may be seated. Thank you.